Aardje kreeg je de houri. Hij is zo stoonhengs, kloetig en smiegloetig. Waar de wilt drieën, sassen of waan je, er zijn geen koeurig. Kindjes geloor, ha ik is een taartje en ga aas en meldig. Ga je het hier even nu wachten, ach miskant de jesach kalan er waaien, agus jesgra en nog kukier tjuk, er jawab lefer jolo morganuk, kummerig, vier riesige mag men hebben, agus kileke. As an offering to the ineffable one, we have plucked these branches that we may feed the sacred fire. As our forebears have done in their wisdom, so do we in our day of greater growth. It is well that the sacred circle be remembered as you lay your offering on the sacred fire. Ha Diodorus Siculus, a Gisha, got a yule and tangle look, can toch jan it yeuhen. A laven yuni, the fistlich and the nata nit yugach, ayus ekero kind nit yugh. Drie in de geltig en nog een rietje schraan moorgoesig. Alles wat vier goeig kachken. Een bericht in alles in Gallia van de drie in het roeinke tjou naar rangen.
the finds that we've made in the, the Stonehenge Hidden Landscapes project really do change how we view Stonehenge. It no longer sits um, isolated in the centre of a, of a plain. We found about 17 new late Neolithic monuments, monuments of the period of the great phases of Stonehenge and monuments which are like Stonehenge, smaller in scale perhaps, but nonetheless intimately linked with the, with the stones themselves and representing what must have been smaller ritual um, shrines or, or something of that sort. In fact, in the field behind me, and I'm only a short distance from Stonehenge, uh, one of the barrows there has been resurveyed, and with it, beneath it and surrounding it are a series of pits which look very much like a, a, a small henge as well. So even that close to Stonehenge, new things are turning up regularly. We've got several different technologies here. We've got magnetometers, we've got ground penetrating radar, we have electromagnetic induction, we have resistance um, instruments also, most of which have been racked on um, together on arrays. The data is being fed straight into onboard computers that are being uh, recording and processing and every measurement is then located with a, an onboard GPS. So we're getting very precise measurements for uh, locations for every single measurement that we, that we record. For some time there's been a mismatch between the ability to capture high resolution data and the ability to actually process it. And we sort of we have to be living in this time which is it's great because you can do both. <laughs> Rather than just sort of look at one data set and understand that, we can start combining data sets. We can sort of fuse them. We call it data fusion. Um, so being able to deal with large data sets and combine them with other data sets, um, there's many, many little mini revolutions going on in technology and archaeology at the moment. When we finished the, this project, when, when the data's been processed, and that's only a matter of days, really, um, we will produce the first substantive map of the landscape of Stonehenge, uh, touching every part of the landscape rather than the bits we knew about, about already. And that is going to fundamentally change how we view the most important archaeological monument in Britain and probably the world. In Neolithic times, the stones were just the very centre of a much larger landscape that surrounded them. In fact, the stones themselves weren't erected until about halfway through the two and a half thousand years or so in which that part of England was being used for ceremonial purposes. More recently, the modern world has been encroaching on the site. The busy road, the noise of traffic have diminished the visitor experience and detached it from the landscape that surrounds the stones. 
The plans to restore the stones to a more natural setting have been on the cards for decades. Squint Opera uh, didn't get involved until 2009 when we were approached by English Heritage. The first piece that we were commissioned to do was to create a film that describes English Heritage's initial vision for Stonehenge, which would help them get funding and the public support they needed. The film describes the broad strategy of what they were proposing and gives you a sense of what the place could be like after the plans have been implemented. We also created a series of images illustrating the early stages of design and later on very detailed and accurate representations of what was being designed so that English heritage could assess internally. In some cases, the things that we visualised speculatively ended up following through almost identically into reality. Such as the transport unit, which was just an idea to be a land train, but in the end it looked almost identical to the way that we portrayed it in the film. The last piece that Squint Opera was commissioned to do was to create a kind of installation film for the visitor centre. To the untrained eye, the monuments might just appear as a series of bumps and hills, but in fact there are a series of burial chambers that were built at different times. Just by having some of these things highlighted, you get to appreciate what they were, and you also get an understanding of what was inside them, when they were made, and how they relate to the stones themselves. Hopefully, all of this has contributed to an experience that is much more immersed in the history and landscape of Stonehenge. Superbly situated in southern England's rural heartland, few destinations can match the amazing diversity of Salisbury and Stonehenge. Known as the city in the countryside, the magnificent medieval town of Salisbury has an incredible history. Originally built on an Iron Age hill fort at Old Sarum, it was moved in its entirety nearly two miles away in the 1200s. A fine example of a planned medieval town, Salisbury has largely preserved its original layout. One of the reasons that the town was moved in the 12th century is that the current location has an abundance of water. 
Indeed, the history of Salisbury has been greatly influenced by the five tributaries of the rivers that meet at the site. The Avon, Nadder, Wiley, Bourne and Eble. The main industries in Salisbury were all dependent on river water. Tanning, or leatherworking, was one of the more noxious trades associated with, and located besides, the rivers, and medieval Salisbury was the site of numerous tanners. Historic streets and alleyways, charming half-timbered buildings, traditional English houses, and picturesque shopping streets characterised the city of Salisbury. The citizenry was composed of skilled tradesmen and merchants who were the economic lifeblood of the city. In medieval society, town life was distinct from country life. The two were considered separate, yet interdependent worlds. There were many manifestations of rural life in the city, with gardens, herds of livestock and even farms located within the city walls. That said, townsmen saw themselves as distinct from country folk, and country folk viewed the cities with suspicion and envy. The Avebury Parish Church was significantly enlarged in the late 12th century, around the time that a church revival finally suppressed the lingering pagan beliefs that had survived until then. In the 13th century, the church's dedication was recorded as All Saints, but it now bears a dedication to St. James. Towns were much smaller than modern cities and were generally populated by just a few thousand people. Even the big cities could be measured in the tens of thousands, while a mere handful reached one or two hundred thousand inhabitants. Built on a human scale and remaining true to their roots, Wiltshire's settlements fit naturally into the surrounding landscape. The Stonehenge site is part of a larger complex of monuments that lie either side of the nearby River Avon. The National Trust protects large areas of the countryside throughout Wessex and ensures free open access to all of it. Stonehenge is one of the best known and yet most enigmatic prehistoric sites in the world. Over the centuries there has been intense debate about the significance and intended use of Stonehenge. It is undoubtedly the focal point of a landscape filled with prehistoric ceremonial and burial structures. The Wiltshire region is known for having some of the most stunning scenic drives and picturesque landscapes in the area. The rural area is a county full of historical treasures and famous attractions such as Stonehenge and Avebury. The landscape of Wiltshire, as we see it today, is the product of a series of major changes through which its character has been transformed by the interaction of natural, human and anthropogenic processes. Like most areas in Britain, the landscape of the county bears the imprint of successive periods of human inhabitation and land use. While the basic landforms have remained the same, the covering vegetation and designated land use have been subjected to constant change. These changes are important not only from an archaeological perspective, but also in determining the overall character of the county. Wiltshire has a proud farming tradition, which reaches back thousands of years. Around 72% of the county is currently farmed, which equates to an area of roughly 3,500 square kilometres, and farming continues to be an essential determinant of landscape character in all areas of the region. The stones represent an enormous investment of labour and time. Mammoth effort and great organisation was required to transport these stones, tens and sometimes hundreds of kilometres across land and water, before then shaping and raising them. Only a sophisticated society could have mustered so large a workforce and produced the design and construction skills necessary to build Stonehenge and its surrounding monuments. The number of Bronze Age burial mounds in Wilshire suggests a huge increase in population and a major impact in the opening up of the landscape. The county contains about 130 nearly thick long barrows, but evidence of at least 2,500 Bronze Age round barrows exists. 
Many of these were constructed in the early Bronze Age. Sometimes the barrows are highly visible on ridges and hilltops, while others follow the lines of valleys and streams. During the Middle Bronze Age from 1500 BC, round barrow construction continued, but the most dramatic change in the landscape was the widespread appearance of field systems defined by banks, ditches and possibly hedges. Associated with these fields were small enclosures containing roundhouses and ancillary buildings, which would have been the farmsteads of extended family groups. Stonehenge is one of the most impressive megalithic monuments in the world, on account of the sheer size of its menus, some of which weigh over 50 tonnes. The height of the monument and the exquisite perfection of its design, which is based around a series of concentric circles. Begun as a simple earthwork enclosure, it was built in several stages, with the unique lintelled stone circle being erected in the Neolithic period around 2500 BC. Stonehenge remained an important site well into the early Bronze Age, when many burial mounds were constructed in its vicinity. Stonehenge, together with Avebury and other associated sites, form the heart of a World Heritage Site with a unique and dense concentration of outstanding prehistoric monuments. Stonehenge's orientation in relation to the rising and setting sun has always been one of its most remarkable features. Yet it remains uncertain whether this was because its builders came from a sun-worshipping culture or because, as some have asserted, the circle and its banks were part of a huge astronomical calendar. What cannot be denied is the ingenuity of the builders of Stonehenge. With only very basic tools, such as antler picks and bone shovels at their disposal, they dug the enclosing ditch and erected the bank later using similar tools to dig holes for the stones. Other stone tools were used to shape the mortises and tenons that linked uprights to lintels. Some of these tools can be seen together with other artefacts, including personal material from graves, on display in the museums at Salisbury and Devizes. The monument complexes at Stonehenge and Avebury provide an exceptional insight into the funerary and ceremonial practices in Britain in the Neolithic and Bronze Ages. Construction on the Great Monument began roughly 5,000 years ago and the famous stones that still stand today were put in place about 4,000 years ago. The site evolved from a simple bank and ditch in the Neolithic period to a sophisticated stone circle built on the axis of the midsummer sunrise. The layout of the site was rearranged several times during the Bronze Age. The first monument at Stonehenge was a circular earthen bank and ditch called a henge, which can still be seen today. Unlike other hinges, the ditch lies outside rather than inside the bank. During the second period of construction, from approximately 2900 to 2400 BC, wooden structures were added to the earthenwork enclosure. Excavations have revealed a complicated pattern of post holes in the centre of the hinge, as well as at the northeastern and southern entrances. The third and final phase of Stonehenge's construction occurred between 2600 and 1600 BC, embracing a period of roughly 1000 years. This phase is marked by a change from building in wood to building in stone. It can be divided into three stages. First, a crescent of blue stones from Wales, then the Sarsen stone circle, and finally, the rearrangement of the stones into their present form. The stones are aligned almost perfectly with the sunrise on the summer solstice, and it has been concluded that Stonehenge was built as a spectacular place of worship. The 18th century British antiquarian William Stookley had noticed that the horseshoe of great trilithons and the horseshoe of 19 blue stones at Stonehenge opened up in the direction of the midsummer sunrise. 
It was quickly surmised that the monument must have been deliberately oriented and planned so that on midsummer's morning the sun rose directly over the heel stone and the first rays shone into the centre of the monument between the open arms of the horseshoe arrangement. This alignment implied a ritualistic connection with sun worship and it was generally concluded that Stonehenge was constructed as a temple to the sun. More recently though, the astronomer Gerald Hawkins has argued that Stonehenge is not merely aligned with solar and lunar astronomical events but can be used to predict other events such as eclipses. In other words, Stonehenge was more than a temple, it was an astronomical calculator. Myths, legends and incredible explanations of its construction are linked to this mysterious site. According to 12th century pseudo-historian Geoffrey Monmouth, the monument's blue stones originated in Africa, where ancient giants scooped them up because of their healing properties and transported them to mythical Mount Kilorus in Ireland, where they formed the giant's circle. But when Aurelius Ambrosius, king of the Britons, wanted to create a memorial to slain warriors, the magician Merlin suggested to him that the stones would make excellent building material. The king sent an army to defeat the Irish in battle, but they were unable to move the stones, until Merlin used his sorcery to dismantle the structure and transport it across the sea, proving, in the process, that the supernatural was more potent than brute force. In 1620, the eccentric English architect Inigo Jones was commissioned by King James I to document the structure of Stonehenge and investigate its origin. In 1655, three years after Jones's death, his son-in-law and assistant, John Webb, published a book supposedly based upon notes left behind by the architect. The book depicts Stonehenge as the ruins of a Tuscan-style temple built by the Romans during their occupation of Britain in the 1st through 5th centuries AD to venerate Coleus, the Roman god of the sky. Stonehenge and Avebury are among the most famous groups of megaliths in the world. The two sanctuaries consist of circles of meniers arranged in a pattern whose astronomical significance is still being explored. These holy places and the nearby Neolithic sites are an incomparable testimony to prehistoric times.
Our first dig takes us to Avebury, deep in the heart of our most treasured prehistoric landscape. Over 5,000 years old, Avebury has the largest stone circle in the world, measuring more than a kilometre in circumference. It's part of a vast network of prehistoric burial mounds and monuments, including the world-famous Stonehenge. We used to think that this was just a landscape of sacred sites, but now we're challenging that. For centuries, investigators have been exploring the sacred landscape of Avery, romancing the stones, painting this picture of a landscape that was almost devoid of life, but visited when people came to worship or to bury their dead there. But archaeologists are now interested in looking at that landscape, not only as a, as a sacred space, but as a lived in place. If they can prove that Avebury wasn't just a dead ritual landscape, but the prehistoric people actually lived in and around the stones, they will transform our picture of Stone Age Britain. So teams from Leicester and Southampton universities have joined forces with the National Trust and are focusing on two spots, exploring in the fields that surround the stones and within the very center of the circle itself. Avebury Stone Circle is too precious to dig, so they're using modern surveying equipment to investigate without causing any damage. But in the field overlooking the monument, the team have been granted privileged permission to excavate. OK, well, here we are, day one. We're in the process of beginning the excavation. It's a site that was first discovered in the 1920s and at the time it produced a very rich collection of both early and middle Neolithic flint work. These ancient flints were an intriguing clue that prehistoric people were actively present in the fields surrounding the stones. But are these tools that have simply been dropped by people passing through or were those people more permanently settled here? To find out, the team is examining every inch of ground for evidence of Stone Age flint working. One of the issues is the fact that it's not always easy, especially when you're digging, to recognise what's worked and what's not worked. So the basic policy is for people to keep everything that they think might be uh, worked, and then afterwards we can just sort of go through the trays and root out anything that, that isn't. And with expert eagle eyes, the careful scrutiny soon begins to pay off. We found a lovely piece of middle Neolithic Peterborough ware. It's from the body of the pot and it's got markings on it where people have used their fingernails to indent a pattern. It's very exciting. <laughs> it's good. Over 5,000 years old, this pottery confirms that Stone Age people were active in these fields during the lifetime of the monument. And within the circle itself, the team's survey has produced even more extraordinary results. It's revealed a series of giant stones that once made up a square in the middle of the circle, and at its center, what appears to be the remains of a house. This incredible revelation suggests that people might have been living inside the circle, but were they also living in the surrounding fields? Yeah, we found a nice scraper there, haven't you? Yeah. And you can see this one's been retouched all the way around its um, circumference. So it's the first one we've found on the site. Yes. The scraper on its own isn't evidence of occupation, but each tool that's discovered adds to the picture that's emerging of a busy Stone Age landscape. It is one of the ugliest barbed and tanged heads I've leaf. ever found. Sort of a apprentice level. Yes. I mean, that could be made by a kid, couldn't it? It suggests that whoever made this was basically still learning how to nap flint properly. And it's quite nice to find that kind of evidence of different sort of skill sets. This makes it a bit more human. These tools give insights into day-to-day -day prehistoric life. But the team then makes an even bigger breakthrough, finding evidence that this was much more than just a Stone Age workshop. In front of me we have a small pit. Within it so far we've found pieces of cattle bone, charcoal and hazelnut shells. Sorts of things you can imagine people sort of cracking open and uh, eating the nuts and then tossing the shells onto the fire. The team has uncovered several of these pits across the site 
And for Josh, the evidence is mounting up that our ancestors weren't just working, but living here. And the final pit turns up one of the most exciting clues yet. Is it a quernstone? And the answer is yes. In the Neolithic, our ancestors made the transition from being hunter-gatherers to settled farmers, and they used quernstones to grind cereals. For the archaeologists, it's further evidence that people were living and working in the shadow of Avebury. This dig has produced some incredible finds, but how does it transform our picture of this iconic monument and the surrounding prehistoric landscape? I've invited site directors Mark Gillings and Josh Pollard into the lab to find out. And first, I want to know more about that astonishing house. The really exciting thing was, was the discovery in the middle of the, the circle here. Yeah. So this I is mean, extraordinary. The house is that little beastie behind the obelisk. Oh, just right. There. So we've got the obelisk seven metre long, so it would have stood to about six metres high. So they're putting this whopping great stone there. Then we have a square of substantial standing stones, 30 metre in diameter, centred on the house. So they're basically echoing the house but on a colossal scale, huge so monumental scale. So this is not a reef structure? No, no. no. Really? This is a square circle, oh. if that makes any sense whatsoever. <laughs> um, <laughs> suggestions on a postcard. <laughs> or, or the square call. The square call. <laughs> uh, apparently you can get cream from boots for that. <laughs> so you've got a square around the site of a former house, but elaborating it, enhancing it, you know, monumentalising it, if you like. Then we've got a huge stone circle surrounding the square and the house. The geometric centre of that circle is slap bang in the middle of the house. Mm. So does this, this building in the centre, does that predate the actual stone circle? Yeah. 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 No, ab absolutely. Gives us an insight into the origins of the Henge itself, I think. The discovery of this early house is an important revelation, but incredibly the dig has revealed that the surrounding area was also densely populated. There are a good number of tools that we, we came across, including um, these nice early Bronze Age barbed and tanged arrowheads. Oh, lovely. Which is a, an amazing piece of flint work. So when does that date you then? Um, somewhere between about 2400 to 1800 BC. Yeah. I mean, I must say, looking at the, looking at the film of you on site, and it's, uh, you know, Josh, when you're standing there with that tray and, you, and sorting through those flints, mm. flinging one out, but, you know, what painstaking work. It's not easy yes. to throw them quite so no. boldly. And <laughs> it, doesn't, it comes with years of, of practice. Yeah. Yes. We, we were quite surprised, actually, by the results because we knew that there was a flint scatter there from the 1920s work. We'd done a little bit of field walking, but what we found was that the scatter was continuing. It's a much bigger scale than we imagined. It's a place that's repeatedly visited, probably from the late Mesolithic right through into the early Bronze Age. There's clear evidence of people actually living there for periods of time as well. It's a much busier, kind of dynamic and alive landscape. These could have been places which were just as significant, just as sort of laden with history and, and associations as many of the big monuments. The Avebury Project is helping to transform the story of one of our most famous prehistoric monuments, and perhaps it should make us think differently about Stonehenge as well. Archaeologists are now revealing that Britain's ancient monuments weren't empty and hushed sanctuaries, but bustling places full of people. And if you just count stone circles, nothing else, just stone circles, there's nearly a thousand of them. It's incredible that out of all those sites, most people only seem to know this one. Now obviously, I'm not being dismissive of Stonehenge itself. Just the fact that when visitors come to marvel at the imposing monoliths, they miss the scale and significance of the entire complex. There are literally hundreds of prehistoric sites spreading for miles in all directions. Earthworks, long barrows, avenues of stones, burial sites and the massive cursus, they all show that this was a huge, thriving community. Woodhenge, a couple of miles northeast, is the remains of a complex timber structure, probably an enclosed circular building which sat on its own raised mound, long since flattened by ploughing. 
West Kennet Long Barrow to the north, at 350 feet long, is the largest chambered tomb in England and Wales. And a little further north again is Silbury Hill, the biggest man-made mound in Europe. It's estimated that to build this giant would have taken 500 men working every day for 10 years. The term henge originally came from Stonehenge. In Old English it refers to the hanging stones or lintels, but it came to mean something quite different, and ironically Stonehenge itself is not, strictly speaking, a henge. Henges have a ditch inside the raised bank, but at Stonehenge the ditch lies on the outside, which implies that they had quite different functions. The true henge of this vast Wiltshire complex is Avebury. Avebury is over 20 miles north of Stonehenge, a short day's walk for our ancestors, and it is without doubt the grandest ceremonial site in Britain. Today its splendour is really only visible from the air, but when it was built it must have been a breathtaking sight. When Avebury was excavated in the early part of the 20th century, the surrounding ditch was found to have been sheer-sided and 30 feet deep. On the outside of the ditch was a wide flat terrace running at the foot of the bank which towered 20 feet above the central earthwork. Our ancestors excavated 150,000 tonnes of chalk rubble to create the ditch, an immense undertaking for something clearly of immense importance. And it wasn't the only one in the region. 50 miles to the west in Somerset stands the deceptive stone circle of Stanton Drew. It looks pretty boring, doesn't it? An enormous stone circle with a smaller outer one at each end. But its bland appearance on the landscape gives no clue as to its original scale and importance. This circle is over a hundred meters across. Now in diameter that makes it second only to the vastness of Avebury. Some years ago the Ancient Monuments Laboratory of English Heritage carried out a magnetometer survey across the whole site and what they discovered is breathtaking. Inside the circle were nine concentric rings of wooden posts, each post a meter apart and each post a meter or more across. Now you don't use a post a meter or more across unless you need it to be tall and on top of that the whole site was surrounded by a ditch and a raised bank. It may have been wood but this would have been every bit as impressive as the stone circles of Stonehenge and Avebury. 